Hanif, just tell me first what you remember about Boxing Day last year. I'd been ill for about uh, three weeks with an illness, an infection in my stomach called diverticulitis. And I'd been taking a lot of painkillers. I had a lot of constipation and a lot of agony. Anyway, I went to Rome for Christmas to see uh, my partner, Isabella. I shouldn't have gone really, I was feeling really rotten. But anyway, I went for a walk uh, in the Villa Borghese, my favorite place. Uh, and then when I got home, I was just chilling out, watching football. I, I remember fainting. Uh, and then I woke up dying. Uh, I seemed to have stood up and fallen flat on my face, bounced on my head, uh, more or less broken my neck. I knew at that moment that I was going to die and I thought I didn't want to die in this rather ridiculous position. You thought these were your last moments, basically? I really did. Isabella came out of the bathroom. She was there. She saved my life. Uh, she kept me still and then the medics came to, to take me away to the hospital. But during the half an hour or so that I was lying there on the floor, I, I thought this is death and it's come for me. I decided at one point that I should, uh, that I should uh, FaceTime my children, but Isabella thought it was not a very good idea. So <laughs> it might be a bit of a shock for them to see their father dying live on FaceTime. I mean, you're funny about it now. At the time, presumably, you were howling, were you? I was in a pool of blood. And also, I had this strange sensation because I saw these objects lying on the floor around me, and I realised it was my arms. I didn't know what they were, and I realised that my, that my body was not connected to my brain anymore. When you went into the hospital, how long was it before you really understood what had happened? It was a few days, really, and then, then it was very painful and then I had an operation and then I began to to understand what I could and couldn't do. I have some, I can, I can move my arm as you can see I'm waving my arm around now. I'm my life feeling throughout my whole body I can move my left leg to a certain extent so I had to gradually piece myself together over the next few weeks. So what had actually happened to your spinal cord and your neck then? Well uh, it, it, uh, my brain and the rest of my body are disconnected. So I can send signals to my hand, say like move your thumb, but I can't in fact move my thumb. So all the stuff that you can do that you take for granted, I can't do now. I'm going to have to relearn if that's going to be possible. Do they think it will be possible? To a certain extent it is possible, yeah, to get to relearn those connections, yeah, because I've got sensibility in my whole body. And a lot of what you've just said, you've documented in writing, in posts on Substack and Twitter, and you've got this amazing sort of loyal following with these, you know, it's dark humour, the way you told what just happened. I, I was smiling, but it's also awful. I mean, yeah. what, why was it important for you to, to write this down? It's a very good question because I don't really know why, because although I'm a writer, you don't necessarily have to write all the time. You don't have to write every day. You don't have to say everything that's ever happened to you. But... Um, I was writing a blog a day when I first had the accident. It might have been partly the cortisone that made me quite high. Um, but it was also the fact that I had to keep connected to myself, to my inner being, you know. And you were physically broken, but I suppose doing the blog was proof to yourself and the world that your brain was still there. My brain was still working. I was still thinking. I still had ideas. I still made jokes. I still had a family. I still had a life. I had to try and reconstruct myself out of the broken bits and pieces that were lying on the floor around me. And you're turning these posts on Substack and Twitter into a book, Shattered. Tell us about the business of writing because of course you can't pick up a pen. I've been very lucky in all this business because of my family, but mostly because of my beautiful partner, Isabella. She's Italian and, and she doesn't always understand my English and I have to shout it every day at her. She's been with me every day through this whole thing. She comes to the the, the hospital first thing in the morning and she stays to the end of the, 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 the night because I'm frightened of being alone. Uh, and I shout the post at her, I dictate it to her. And she writes it down and, and then sends it to Carla and then uh, we publish it straight away. But I can't, obviously I can't use my hand. I don't know if I'll ever hold a pen again. And I love writing the physical act of actual writing. I don't know whether I'll ever do that again. And what is that? do to you when you think about that, that you might not pick up a pen again? I've lost a lot. There's a lot of things I'm not going to be able to do again, you know? And it's going to be the same for all of us. There's going to be a moment in all of our lives when there's lots of things we're never going to be able to do again. Uh, but I didn't die. I mean, it sounds 
in a way that you've reached a kind of peace with this awful thing that's happened to you. But um, when you read the post, there, there's, there's desolation there, there's pain. There's also this incredible humour. I mean, Salman Rushdie says that you're mischievous and outrageous. What made you carry on being mischievous and outrageous? I've been really depressed. I've been more depressed in the last few weeks since I came to, back to London. But uh, there are some parts of me that still remain, and there's uh, essential parts of me that uh, is my humour and my sense of the world that I, st I still have to a certain extent. I've been through a, a terrible suffering. You know, one day on Boxing Day, I walked through a door, you know, and that door uh, opened onto a hell which has become my new life. I've been living in a hospital since January, you know. Before that, I had a very good life, loving family, a dog, a good career, and I was respected and admired. Now I, I, I'm living in an absolute hell. It's to hell to live in a hospital, even though obviously the staff are nice and the doctors are nice and everything, but you wouldn't want it for yourself. I wouldn't want it for any, any of you. It's been a terrible, terrible thing. We've brought you out of the hospital today, but I know you, you fantasise about escaping, don't you? I fantasise all the time about going home, about being well. It's uh, 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 a gender and calls it a year of magical thinking. You have fantasies of being well, of reparation and so on. But I know that I've got to live with what I've got. I just, uh, this hospital isn't so far from my actual house, you know. Uh, I just want to be at home with my partner Isabella living my life again. Tell us what you found hardest about being in hospital. I know you were on a dementia ward for several weeks. How, what, what was difficult for you about all of that? Basically, it's like sleeping in a shopping centre. It's noisy, the nurses come into your room, they wake you up at five o'clock in the morning to give you a wash. Everyone's kind and compassionate, they do their best work, you know, but you're an abstract object for them. And you realise that death has got you in its sights. That's the, the thing I think about the most, is death. Uh, and how much I suffer and what a relief death would be from some of the suffering, that, uh, the physical suffering, the mental suffering that I feel. And your last post was very desolate. Are you, do you feel in some ways that you're losing hope? I, I do lose hope and then other people cheer me up. I've had a lot of friends come to visit me. I'm never alone during the day. I'm frightened of being alone. People are always talking to me. People have been very kind to me. There's this huge reservoir of love and hope in the world that I've discovered that's really cheered me up. I mean, Salman Rushdie writes to you every day, is that right? Salman Rushdie is a much braver man than, than, than me and he's been through a very fierce uh, and painful ordeal himself and he's been very kind. He writes to me, tries to cheer me up and I write to him and try and cheer him up. So both of us have suffered a lot for very different reasons and we are very good friends. And what is it that is preventing you from leaving the hospital now? Because I know you're supposed to go on to a different hospital, aren't you? What's stopping that? At the moment, I, I'm in a normal everyday hospital. I need to be on a specialised rehab unit where I can have specialised help to use my arms and legs again. And I'm waiting. I'm a bit jammed up in the NHS system, which works very well most of the time. But it's a bureaucracy and it works very slowly. And, and, it, and I'm just in a normal everyday hospital on a dementia ward, which is rather sad and quite moving. I mean, obviously, there's been such a lot of debate recently about the, the state of the NHS. I guess you're, in a way, on the front line. I mean, from that vantage point, what would you say needs to change? Well, one of the things that you notice about the NHS is what a wonderful resource it is and how well it works and how kind everybody is in there and how multiracial, multicultural it is. The other thing you notice about it is that how stressed out everybody is and worn out and there aren't enough staff. How much can you do because you have been quite graphic about your symptoms and I think a lot of people have found that moving, distressing and funny by equal turns. So what frustrates you most about what you can what you can't do and you know what can you do? What I can do is try and be close to other people, try and love other people, try and listen to other people and try and enjoy their conversation. You know, I can't sit in a room all day uh, on my own with a pen and write, which is what I used to do. And I can't even read anymore. I don't watch movies, I don't watch, read the newspapers or anything like that. Why do you think that is? I'm out of my depression and my despair. I have lost interest in the world. I've got no appetite. I don't eat at the moment. I'm very weak. But I, I, I've got other people. That's my main resource. And you've written about how hard you find the nights. What is it about the nights that upsets you and, and makes you fear? Oh, I hate it when Isabella has to leave. I have to be uh, uh, separated from her, apart from her. Uh, and also I worry a lot about the strain on her that this is putting on her because 
when somebody lo lo like me has an accident, it's an accident that happens to the whole family. It's a bomb goes off in the middle of a whole family. But I have the love of my family and I, I love them and I found love in a new way that I didn't know I had before. You said in one of your posts you wish you'd been a better person. What did you mean? Well, when I see how people are kind they've been to me, people ring me up and they offer me money, they come and visit me, they bring me things every day, their kindness is overwhelming. I often wonder whether I should have done more of that myself. When do you realistically think you will get home, pick up a pen and start to write again? If it ever happens, it'll be a, be a year. If I can get through this difficult, difficult bit, which is very difficult, very painful, very depressing, and I'm not eating, if I can get through this, maybe in a year I'll be a bit in a better shape, and I'll come on your programme and talk to you again. Hanif Qureshi, thank you. Thank you.